since I started this letter, I've drank, drunken, drunk, two more beers, and so I'm ready to say this now. Here goes. M, we've known each other five or six years now, but two years properly, as you know, friends, which isn't that long, but I think I know a bit about you, and I think I know what your problem is. And be aware that I have a low 2-2 two -two in anthropology, so I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> if you don't want to hear my theory, stop reading now. Good. Here it is. I think you're scared of being happy, Emma. I think you think that the natural way of things is for your life to be grim and grey and dour and to hate your job, hate where you live, not to have success or money or, God forbid, a boyfriend. And a quick discursion here, that whole self-deprecating thing about being unattractive is getting pretty boring, I can tell you. In fact, I'll go further and say that I think you actually get a kick out of being disappointed and underachieving because it's easier, isn't it? Failure and unhappiness is easier because you can make a joke out of it. Is this annoying you? I bet it is. Well, I've only just started. Em, I hate thinking of you sitting in that awful flat with the weird smells and the noises and the overhead light bulbs all sat in that laundrette. And by the way, there's no reason in this day or age why you should be using a laundrette. There's nothing cool or political about laundrettes. It's just depressing. I, I don't know, Em, you're, you're young, you're practically a genius, and yet your idea of a good time is to treat yourself to a service wash. Well, I think you deserve more. You're smart and funny and kind, too kind if you ask me, and by far the cleverest person I know, and I'm drinking more beer here. Deep breath, you are also a very attractive woman, and more beer, yes, I do mean sexy as well, although I feel a bit sick writing it down. Well, I'm not gonna scribble it out because it's politically incorrect to call someone sexy, because it is also true. You are gorgeous, you old hag, and if I could give you just one gift forever for the rest of your life, it would be this. Confidence. It would be the gift of confidence. Either that or a scented candle. <laughs> I know from your letters and from seeing you after your one-woman show that you feel a bit lost right now about what to do with your life, a bit rudderless and aweless and aimless, but that's okay, that's all right, because we're all meant to be like this at 24. In fact, our whole generation is like that. I read an article about it. It's because we never fought in the war or watched too much telly or something. Anyway, the only people with oars and rudders and aims are dreary bores and squares and careerists. I certainly don't have a master plan. I know you think I've got it all sorted out, but I haven't. I, I worry too. I just don't worry about the doll and housing benefit and the future of the Labour Party and where I'm going to be in 20 years' time and how Mr Mandela is adjusting to freedom. <laughs> the thing is, Em, running back to the hostel in the rain just now, the rain is warm here. Hot even sometimes, not like London rain. I was, like I said, pretty drunk, and I found myself thinking about you and thinking what a shame isn't M isn't here to see this, to experience this. And I had this revelation, and it's this. You should be here with me in India. And this is my big idea, and it might be insane, but I'm gonna post this before I change my mind. Follow these simple instructions. One, leave that crappy job right now. Let them find someone else to melt cheese on tortilla chips for £2.20 an hour. Put a bottle of tequila in your bag and walk out the door. Think what that will feel like, Em. Walk out now. Just do it. Two, I also think you should leave that flat. Tilly's ripping you off charging all that money for a room without a window. It isn't a box room, it's a box. And you should get out of there and let someone else ring out her great big grey bras for her. Three, as soon as you've read this, go to the student travel agency on Tottenham Court Road and book an open return flight to Delhi to arrive as near as possible to August the 1st, two weeks' time, which, in case you've forgotten, is my birthday. The night before, get a train to Agra and stay at a cheap motel. Next morning, get up early and go to the Taj Mahal. Perhaps you've heard of it. Big white building named after that Indian restaurant on the Lothian Road. <laughs> Have a look around, and at precisely 12 midday, you stand directly under the center of that dome with a red rose in one hand and a copy of Nicholas Nickleby in the other, and I will come and find you, Em. I will be carrying a white rose and my copy of Howard's End, and when I see you, I will throw it at your head. <laughs> Isn't that the greatest plan you've ever heard in your life? For 300 pounds of someone else's money, you could change your life. And you mustn't worry about it because, frankly, I have money that I haven't earned and you work really hard and you don't have money, so it's socialism, isn't it? And if you really want, you can pay me back when you're a famous playwright or when the poetry money kicks in or whatever. <laughs> On the wall in front of me is this massive sort of praying mantis thing and he's looking at me as if to say, shut up now, so I will. It's stopped raining and I'm about to go to a bar and meet up with some new friends for a drink three female medical students from Amsterdam, which tells you all you need to know. But on the way, I'm gonna find a post box and send this before I change my mind. Not because I think you coming here is a bad idea. It isn't. It's a great idea and you must come. 
but because I think I might have said too much. I'm sorry if this has annoyed you. The main thing is that I think about you a lot, that's all. Dex and M, M and Dex. Call me sentimental, but there's no one in the world that I'd like to see get dysentery more than you. <laughs> Taj Mahal, the 1st of August, 12 noon. I will find you. Love, Dexter. Thank you very much.